Now today we have a couple of different topics. Um, first is uh, Richard uh, Tupik gave me a very nice example illustrating the mathematics of the central limit theorem and he actually gave it to me, I don't know, one year or half a year ago and I completely forgot it and now he reminded me and uh, yeah, I want to show you the so-called Galton machine and it's a script uh, I don't know, Richard, you programmed it or you? No, I just modified the script. You modified the script, okay. And I modified it again yesterday evening. Um, a little bit. Yeah? Okay, so this is the Galton machine. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Oops. Ja. Ah, jetzt habe ich keine Maus da. Moment, rechte Taste. Ja. Ach, und jetzt brauchen wir da oben noch die Leiste zum Starten, oder? Weiß das jemand, wie man das startet? Ups. The tool that we use here is, it's called Fusion. It's a physics simulator, for, but only for two dimensions, unfortunately. Otherwise, it would be a really cool tool. But it's nice, it's nice for playing around. So it simulates physics in two dimensions, and then it's quite easy with the language Python to specify such worlds. And here we have, I mean, just let's start it. You see, there are little balls falling down in this uh, world here. Yeah, yeah, I guess. I mean, we we could also increase gravity a little bit. Dark widgets, seam properties. And here we can increase gravity. That uh, makes it faster. Oh, now we have positive gravitation. Now uh, it's uh, a gravity of uh, 3G, and now everything goes a little bit faster. I mean, you see these balls falling down, and then they will fill up these bins. And now what do you see? Hmm? You see a normal distribution. I don't see a normal distribution. I don't see a normal distribution, no. I mean, it's something that, with some fantasy, might be similar to a normal distribution, yes. So, I mean, the first thing we observe is that in these pins in the middle, we have more balls than uh, out here. Yeah? And, yeah, maybe, maybe now we should modify the whole thing and uh, look at it again. Um, yeah. We can, uh, for example, yeah, let's do this here. We, uh, we reduce the height of the whole game to one. Um, and we do a reload. Oh no, that's not what we want. Evaluate script. 
Spalten Maschinen. Okay. Now the whole uh, game, it's only one level. And let's start it. And now if I ask you what can you see, would you again say a normal distribution? I wouldn't say a normal distribution. I would say it's more or less these two bins are filled and all the others are empty. And how would we call this distribution? We had it in the lecture not uh, too long ago. A uniform distribution, I, hmm. yes, I mean, you could say it's a uniform distribution for the discrete case, yes? But we had in particular this distribution with two pins. What's the name of this distribution? It's a Bernoulli distribution. Huh? This is the distribution you get when you have a, a, a random event with two outcomes, 0 and 1, and a probability p for 0 and 1 minus p for 1. And now here it looks like p is equal to 0.5, so with probability 0.5 the balls fall into this bin, and with 0.5 they fall into that bin. Uh, and, and that's actually the same thing we had when we talked about our random number generators. Uh, such a, a random bit generator produces 0 and 1 bits with probability 0.5. And that's exactly what we have here. Huh? So we have a discrete distribution with these two discrete outcomes. Huh? Uh, both with probability 0.5. And then what happens is you just get these two outcomes and you won't get these here. And I mean this, you know where, where this came from. It came from, from outside. Huh? And this is not part of our distribution. Okay, why don't we do the game again with two levels? And you're right, it's again a uniform distribution. That's quite funny. I would have expected something different. Huh? In the middle should be much more... Yeah, it, it should be filled much more. But let's, uh, let's restart it and you will see why this is not the case. The point is that these balls from the middle, they get some, look, many are just falling like that. Huh? So this is no longer a two-step random machine. It's far from being random what, hap what happens here. Huh? So we, we could modify the geometry of these uh, um, little objects here and, it would be, and then it would be more random. But, yeah, um, maybe we should reduce gravity. Mm. 
minus 5. How about this? <coughs> hmm? Oh, it's minus 30 again. What's that? Oh. <laughs> so what now happens again is far from random. Oops. At least it's a nice toy. And this toy is called Fusion. I think the spikes, they should be uh, exactly even, not, not, not like green. Yeah, okay, you, you can modify it if you want. But um, if we, I mean, I actually didn't make experiments with two levels and uh, that's what happens when you do experiments in the lecture without trying them before. Um, yeah, but let's modify the whole thing and do uh, like 40 levels. And then you get actually what we want to see. Okay, yeah, this takes a little bit more time. And now we have to increase gravity again, minus 30. Oh, this is quite slow. Ah, yeah, and we can, but we can uh, Make the whole thing faster. If we use only 30 hertz, it's getting faster. I mean, what you see here is, it's kind of similar to what happens if you look at a, at a tree in autumn when the leaves are falling down. And if it's a really high tree, and then you observe the lawn below the tree, you will see a density distribution of leaves. Huh? And these leaves falling down randomly, it's kind of similar because of this random behavior of the air turbulence around the leaves. It may fall a little bit in this direction and in this direction and so on. And, and down there we will get a, quite a nice distribution in our bins. And now this distribution may look quite similar to a uh, normal distribution. And maybe while these balls are still falling, please think of the central limit theorem. 
What does that have to do with the central limit theorem? The central limit theorem tells us that uh, no matter how our underlying distribution is, if we take the sum of independent identically distributed variables, n independent identically distributed variables, and we sum them up, then the result is a normal distribution. Why is this the sum of n independent identically distributed random variables? Yeah, and I mean, this is kind of similar to a, a normal distribution. Yeah, I mean, th these are quite nice effects here, this uh, bouncing of the pins. Um, I don't know where this comes from. I guess uh, this is not realistic in terms of friction. So these balls are perfectly elastic and they will, uh, they will jump all the time. But we can, we can now reduce gravity. Okay, so now why, why is this exactly a nice illustration of the central limit theorem? So what we have here, this, this distribution is the distribution of such a summation of variables. So two questions. What is our input variable and what's the distribution of the input variable? First question. And second, what is our n? Remember what I showed you before, here, in, in this experiment. Number of levels. The number of levels. What is the number of levels? Variables. Variables. That's the number of, uh, of variables, yes. And what is our input variable? So these individual variables, how are they distributed? I showed you before. When we took one level, then we have our individual variable. And it's, it's a, Bernoulli, a Bernoulli distribution with p equal 0.5. That's what we have. So that's exactly what we did when we produced our random bits. Yeah? This is exactly what we did when we, when we made the symmetry test. Huh? We take many random bits and take the sum of all of them. And the distribution of the sum of many random bits will be like that. So if it's the sum of 40 random bits, then you will have such a distribution, similar to this. But now let's answer the question, why is the number of levels, why does it produce the sum of our variables? Because they are depending on each other. What is depending on what? I mean, every next variable is depending on the previous variable. <laughs> 
I hope not. Because uh, the assumption in the central limit theorem is that we have independent variables. And if we make the physics of this simulation good enough, then we can assume it's approximately independent. That's what actually I wanted to. Maybe the physics of, of these little obstacles here is not perfect and you can, you can improve it if you want. That's the I mean, if, it if we would have a perfect dependence, then we wouldn't get such a nice uh, distribution which looks like a normal distribution. Huh? Um, but while we discuss, we could start the whole thing again. Why is it the sum of the individual variables? You can see it why it's the sum. Look, I mean, this first obstacle produces a splitting into these two uh, um, two values. In these two values, like zero and one, and now this value again, you add another variable, another splitting. And then you add another and you add another. So this means the deviation from the center point adds up, it sums up. Huh? So it's a sum of many binary random variables. So these guys falling down here, they will, we, we add to this value another binary variable with this and this path. And then to this we add another binary variable and so on. So this is a really nice illustration of the sum of n independent identically distributed random variables. Yeah, okay. I really recommend you downloading this open source simulator and playing around a little bit. And I'm sure you can improve the geometry of these obstacles even more. And actually what I did yesterday evening, because before it was even worse, um, I added these little peaks here, because before we had them, it may happen that a ball falls down here and then just wanders around on one level and falls down here then again. Um, Okay, any questions, any wishes? Should we modify something? And you have seen it's also nice to now uh, take a positive gravity. It's really nice playing around with the whole thing. Yeah, it would be nice to see how the distribution now becomes up there. But to have this, this perfect uh random thing, I think this, the, the gap between those spikes is, should be exactly the size of one ball or not. Yes, the, I mean if the, if the gap, you, you should make the gap uh, quite small. But this of course incre increases the computation time on my laptop here. Right? Uh, because the whole thing then is much slower. You see we can also add horizontal gravity. It's very nice and, and, and the, 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 the game comes with, with many uh, nice applications, but we don't do this now. Um, we'll just stop it. No. OK. 
Okay, yes, and now, um, yeah, let's talk about uh, the exercise. So I pr produced an exercise, uh, it's, it's only one exercise, you will get the sheet uh, in, I don't know, uh, half an hour. Um, oh, you got it? Ah, oh, Robin has been here, I didn't see him. Okay, thank you. That's nice. Um, this is an exercise about um, doing function approximation with radial basis functions and with polynomials. Um, and it's quite similar to what I did in the lecture and I will, I will also do some octave uh, experiments with you now. I will basically solve this exercise and you will do it at home again with some extensions. Yeah? So in, in part A you produce uh, data points coming from a sine function with some added noise. That's exactly what we did in the lecture. Um, and there are some suggestions about the, the size of the random noise, you should use a sigma of 0.2, but of course you can vary it, you can use less or more sigma. Um, and then you, you apply the pseudo-inverse method to fit polynomials of various degrees uh, to these points. And then in C you use the radial basis functions to fit um, uh, to these points. Um, and it will be quite interesting to see the differences between the polynomials of various degrees and the radial basis functions. And yeah, for the radial basis functions you should use as centers the x values of the points and, and you may use sigma e equal to 1, you can use a bigger or smaller sigma and you should actually and uh, look at the results. Um, yeah, and then you repeat all the experiments with added regularization term and then compare with and without regularization. And then in E, uh, then you do all the previous experiments again with two new functions. And this is really new, and, uh, but that's very important. Um, now you use two-dimensional functions. So now the input is no longer one-dimensional, it's a multi-dimensional input. And you can, uh, maybe we should add another uh, subtask F where you use 20-dimensional input. Because it makes no difference in programming it two-dimensional or 20-dimensional. You just use a multi-dimensional normal distribution and in Octave or in MATLAB there is a function for the normal distribution, you have to input uh, the mu vector and the, the sigma, uh, the covariance matrix and, uh, and that's it. And then you get an, an n-dimensional normal distribution. The only thing is plotting in 20 dimensions is a problem. Huh? And that's why here I asked you to do it in two dimensions because then you can plot the results and then you compare your original function and the approximated function and that of course will be quite interesting. Yeah? Um, and you will see differences between using uh, polynomials and radial basis functions. Yeah? Okay, yeah, and why don't we now uh, look into Octave and uh, yeah. And now, uh, oh no, this is the wrong example. Yeah, we have to load something different. Um. Oh yeah, this is the wrong directory.
Okay. So here we do Bayesian linear regression and let's look which we use. Yeah, RBF. Let's first do it with the polynomial. Um, but maybe we do it in the simpler case without such a nice function. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, can you read this? Yeah. So, the first uh, thing we do is we uh, use, we produce a vector of our x values. Octave, okay. Okay, so now here we have a column vector of x values uh, between 0 and 10. Maybe, yeah. Then n is the length of this vector, and then we produce a y vector. Um, oh, sigma undefined. Yeah, let's say sigma equal to point and now we get our y ve vector um, and we could actually plot um, x comma y <coughs> and here you see a plot of our uh, data points um, yeah that's the curve coming from this underlying sine function with added noise. And now what we need is this uh, matrix containing all the function uh, values. So that's the matrix we called uh, in, so we called it M. And, and it's Mij is equal to Fj of Xi. Uh, so this, this is this rectangular matrix containing um, the function values of all basis functions applied to all input points. Uh, and that's, we can produce it like that. Yeah. But let me. Um, why do we have the sine of x and the cosine? Oh, yes, uh, okay, sorry. I mean, what we have here is. I mean, we can do it with that. What I told you, I mean, you, you use all the basis functions, fj of xi. And what I used here in this example is, I use these two basis functions, sine and cosine, to approximate the function. Okay, so it's not polynomials, we use the sine and the cosine, and we are looking for a linear combination of sine and cosine. Okay, then we determine the number of columns. Um, k is equal to 2 and now uh, yeah okay we don't we do have this sigma alpha yeah okay and now this formula let's look at this lambda times uh, 
Oh, lambda is undefined, okay. Lambda equal to 0.1. And now do it again, yeah. Let's look at this formula before. Uh, a map, th this is, I mean, we determine the vector A with our coefficients and this map stands for maximum a, a priori probability. That's what we did when we uh, did the, the Bayesian linear regression. And at the end, with Bayesian linear regression, we got this formula including the regularization term and that's what we have. Lambda times i of k comma k and this function i from octave produces um, the identity matrix with the ones in the diagonal. Uh, so you have an identity matrix of size k times lambda plus m transpose m. That's what we have here. F matrix transposed, that's the, the, the um, apostrophe here, times m. Um, yeah, okay. So let's write down the formula. So we get A is equal to lambda times I plus M transpose M inverse times um, M transpose times our Y vector. Huh? That's the formula we know from the lecture. And here we have this part and now there is a uh, let's call it a trick in Octave. I mean, we could of course apply the inverse function to this whole matrix, invert it, and then multiply it um, with, with this here. But what's better in Octave, it saves computation time first and it gives better numerics, is to use the how is it called? It, 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 I guess it's called the, the left division operator. Look, if I have something like um, a matrix A times X vector is equal to some Y vector. Huh? And then you would solve this like X vector is A inverse times Y vector. Huh? Um, and now in octave it goes like x is equal to a and then comes the backslash y vector. This is actually the same as that. Uh? That's how you, how you should do it in octave. Uh? Because then it's much faster and you, you get better numerical results. And that's what you see here. Backslash uh, F matrix transpose times Y. And here we have our two parameters. And now we can do the whole thing with lambda equal to zero. Zero times and we call it then a ML because this is what we get from maximum likelihood. And you see the parameters are a little bit different. Okay, and now we are going to plot the results. We produce an array of x values for plotting and now we plot the results. And that's what we get. So the green curve is our original sine function in the interval between 0 and 10. And then we get um, two approximations. So the, the, blue, the blue line is the maximum likelihood and the red line is uh, with the regularization, so the Bayesian result. Yeah, okay. And of course it's not really surprising that it really looks like a sine function because the two basis functions we used are sine and cosine. Yeah? 
Um, so, of course, I mean, if you know, if you know that the underlying data come from such a, um, a periodic processing with a sine or cosine function, then it's of course a good idea to use sine and cosine as basis functions. If you know this. If you know this and you use polynomials, you would be thumb. Huh? Of course, you always have to input all your knowledge you have in order to get a good approximation. But quite often, it's the case that you don't know the underlying process and then you have to use some generic basis functions. And that's the real problem in functional approximation. If you don't know the underlying process and then you don't want to guess about what type of basis functions to use. You want to have a, a generic uniform algorithm. Okay, and now we can do the same thing with radial basis functions. Yeah. Okay, so we have the same um, x and we use the same underlying function here, the sine plus sigma times uh, some random noise. Oh yes, and maybe I should tell you this rand n produces rand n produces normally distributed random uh, values with uh, and these two parameters you get a matrix so let's let's just try it rand n of 3,4 gives you a 3 by 4 matrix of random random values and as you can see, you get negative and positive values. Um, it produces normally distributed uh, 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 numbers with mean zero and uh, variance one. That's what rand n gives you. If you want, if you want to have a different mean, what would you do? I mean, this function has no parameters. You, can, you cannot enter a mu or a sigma. But what would you do to get a, diff a different mu? You would just, just add a constant value. You would add your mu and then of course you, you will have a mean, uh, this mean. And if you want um, a different sigma, yeah, look, that's what you do. You just multiply the result with sigma but of course, please first multiply and then add the mu. Otherwise, you, uh, you don't get what you want. Huh? Um, okay, actually, yeah, you see, first multiply and then add the mu. Yeah? So the sine values, that's actually our mu. Okay, so that's what we did and maybe now we have to look at this function here. Um, yeah. Look, what we also used in the script was such a function vector, f vector, huh? f vector of x vector. Huh? And this is f1 of x up to fk of x. Huh? And now, because we now use radial basis functions, and we may use many radial basis functions. I don't want to defi define individual functions for every radial basis. Um, and that's why I defined this function. And maybe somebody knows better how to do it, but I mean, it's not too bad what I did here, I guess. Um, so this function f vec returns a vector of all the radi radial basis functions applied to the input vector. Yeah? Um, okay, and the norm PDF gives you the probability density function for a normal distribution applied 
to some input vector x and now we use x transpose as the input vector here with mu 0 and sigma 1. And then the same thing with mu equal 2 and sigma equal to 1. And then with mu 4 and sigma 1. So you see we, we use radial basis functions centered at the points 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 and 10. Because we work on the interval between 0 and 10. Huh? Okay, so let's define this function. Um, yeah, okay, and now here is the same thing with different basis functions. We don't have to worry about this. Now we can produce our F matrix. Um, yeah. Oh no, there is something wrong here. Excuse me. Um, F vec of X. Yeah, so, sorry, there, there was, uh, there is something going wrong with the transpose. Let's use this function, sorry. I mean, this function is even better because it includes the sigma. So it's, it's a function which is variable and I can vary the sigma. No, this is again. Okay, yeah, this is, this is what I wanted to have. So this, this F matrix, it's a rectangular matrix um, and it has six columns um, because, why does it have six columns? Yes, because we have six radial basis functions centered at 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 and 10. Uh, so we have six basis functions applied to all our data points, which should be 11, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. Yeah? So these are the function values of all basis functions applied to all input values x. Okay. Then the number of columns here and um, now let's use lambda equal 0 0.05 and we produce our a vector and we do it, uh, sorry, with maximum likelihood too. And again you see, now you see these values are quite different. And then we do the plotting. Oops. Uh, oh, I should have taken a mouse. Yeah. Can't you just direct here? Yeah? That's glaube ich nicht. Aha. Ah, ja, gut. Also mit einstecken, das könnte ja tatsächlich funktionieren. Cool. Oh ja. Okay, yeah. So that's what we get. So this is our original sine function, the black curve. And we have our data points. And we get the maximum likelihood solution, which is the blue one. And then we get the uh, result with regularization. And here we would say, okay, the blue solution is perfect. Huh? 
and it's much better actually than using the regularization term. But yeah, let's try the same thing with different, uh, with more noise, and then it will be different. Um, so here, so sigma noise. equal to point 0.4. We double the noise. And now we get our y values and yeah. And uh, then we continue with the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's what we get now. Yeah, and now it's a matter of interpretation which result you, you, you do like more. I mean, here you do have a little, a little bit more overshooting from the blue curve. Or maybe here the blue one is better. Um, but still, maximum likelihood is quite good. But now, now let's do what we actually, what I actually proposed in the lecture as the naive uh, approach is you use a radial basis function centered at every data point. What we did now is we had 11 data points, but only six radial basis functions. Yeah? Let's now use 11 radial basis functions, and that's what we get with this. Okay, and now we produce our F matrix. Yeah. We get 11 columns and 11 rows of this matrix. And then let's continue. Okay. And now you see the strength of the Bayesian approach. You see that maximum likelihood actually hits, hits all the points. Why does it hit all the points now? Before it didn't, now it does. Hm? Ja. Ja. So we, we do, that, what he said is we now have 11 basis functions and 11 data points. And why do we now have an exact solution? I mean, when we have 11 basis functions, then we do have 11 parameters to be determined. And look, this linear system here now um, has 11 rows because we want to determine, this is actually a vector here, because we want to determine these 11 parameters. And we do have 11 columns because we have 11 data points. So now it's a linear system with, uh, uh, oh, I, I, sorry, I mean this linear system always has a square matrix. Huh? This always is square. But what's important is this matrix M. Because this matrix M is a square matrix, we get with this solution uh, without this term. Yeah? So without the regularization term, 
we get an exact solution which hits all the points. So that's not surprising at all. But you can, you can see that this, this doesn't make us happy. Huh? Especially if we know that there is noise inherent in our data points. Huh? And here we have quite a bit of noise because sigma is 0.4. Huh? And now the solution with the regularization term looks much better. Huh? And maybe we should repeat the experiment with different, uh, with different lambdas. Uh, now let's let's use lambda um, equal a smaller lambda, 0 0.01 for example. Okay. Oh, I need to get my plotting window again. Okay, that's it with lambda equal 0 0.01 which is still quite good. So let's decrease lambda by a factor of 10. Oops, oh, oh that wasn't good. And now that's what you get. So you can see uh, if we reduce our lambda towards zero of course, it, bec uh, it becomes closer and closer to the maximum likelihood solution. Um, and you can, you can vary lambda um, to obtain a result that satisfies you. But this is actually not satisfactory. I mean, here in one dimension it's nice and you will use the lambda that gives you the best result. But what about 15 dimensions. You can't look at the results anymore. Huh? So in 15 dimensions you would like to have everything fully automatic. Huh? Um, and there are methods to kind of automatically um, adjust lambda. Um, I mean, this is, this is all about then machine learning. I mean, if we do this, the optimization of Lambda, we really get into the machine learning business and that's a whole business and I can tell you since about 25 years I study this business and I know a little bit about how to optimize all this and one favorite method is called cross-validation. So what you then do in high dimensions is you use some, you use different lambdas, yeah? and then you would get different results. And there is no chance to look at the results because it's 15 dimensional. Yeah? But what you can do is, you take your, your data, suppose you do have 1000 data points, and then you take two thirds of the data points, like 700, for adjusting your parameters. And then you've got your parameters and you have your function. And then you test this function on the 300 remaining data points, which your approximation algorithm hasn't seen. And then you calculate the sum of the squared errors of your determined function on the unseen data points. And then you would select a lambda that minimizes the error on the unseen data points. That's a method we call cross-validation. And this uh, helps you optimizing such a regularization uh, constant. And there are other methods for optimizing this lambda. Okay, yeah. So, and uh, yeah, let's make one more experiment with a very large lambda. Let's take lambda equal to 1. What would you expect? Nothing. Ah, 
this is lambda equal to 1. I mean, this is surprisingly nice, isn't it? I mean, it really shows the behavior of our underlying sine function. But let's increase it even more. That's what you get. You get the constant function zero. Okay, yes. So this was, I think it should be enough uh, with playing around with Octave. I mean, it's really nice to do these experiments. And I mean, what you see is the programming is not really difficult. I mean, what do, what do I have to do in programming? I mean, I have to, to define this function which returns me the vector of all function values and then I mean maybe the hardest part of programming is writing down this equality. I mean this doesn't have much to do with programming it's about mathematics. You write down this formula and that's it. Okay, any questions? Do you want me to do some more experiments? If there are more data points, yeah. what is your question then? How to code them, right? You have to define every points. How to produce the data points? Yeah. No. No. Right. Here it's data points and we have to use the functions, rather than different basis functions. Okay, yeah, that's a good question and I don't know an, a nice answer, but hopefully Richard will tell us. So, if I understand you right, this function, I mean it's really not very nice because I explicitly write down 11 normal uh, distributions. Yeah? And I mean of course you could do this with a loop. Yeah? You program a loop and then fill up a vector uh, by using a loop. But I mean the strength of Octave and MATLAB is that it has so nice vector and matrix operations and it would be nice Look, to do something like that. This, this command produces you a vector um, with values starting from 0 up to 10 and an increment of 1. So you get these values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 10. And I would like to use something like that here, but I don't know how to do this. Huh? Um, but yeah, maybe, would it be? I think that wouldn't work. That wouldn't work to write norm PDF x prime comma and then zero comma sigma and then the colon one up to would that work, Richard? Louder, please. I think there's a function PSX fun where you can apply functions on the uh, Oh, there is an, a built-in function which you can use to apply a function on a whole vector and it gives you as a result a vector. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so that's the solution. So what he says is there is a built-in function which you can use to apply a function to a vector and it re repeats a vector. Huh? Returns a vector. Okay, other questions? Oh, you would like to see a polynomial of degree 10? Yeah, why not? So, I do have it somewhere. Where is the polynomial? Polynomial here. Uh, you want to see the result, okay? I mean, what I did here is I wrote a little function that does the whole thing uh, in once. So we have to evaluate this function. Oh, well, why don't I use the mouse? Oh, 
Okay, and now um, we use um, polynomial of degree 10. Okay, that's a polynomial of degree 10. And now um, we do this approximate x, y, and that's what you get. But maybe you should look at, um, at this here first. Warning, matrix singular to machine, machine precision, error count, which is the condition number of the matrix. Um, and so it's, it's very close to singular. So this is something like the determinant of the matrix. And so this matrix inversion cannot be done by Octave. Huh? And um, yeah. So you cannot, you cannot really rely on this result. And it's the same uh, with the lambda and without the lambda. And let's talk about uh, this problem. Because this will actually lead us into the next chapter in the lecture. In the next chapter we will find a solution for exactly this problem. Huh? Now, look, I mean, let's first look at, uh, at the case with lambda equal to zero. M transpose M inverse times M transpose times Y vector. That has to be solved. Our parameter vector, that's the formula. And we are getting problems with this formula. And it, maybe it is surprising at that stage because why do we use this pseudo-inverse method? We use it, I mean, basically we have the problem m times a vector is equal to y vector. That's the problem we want to solve. Why, why couldn't we solve the problem? Why couldn't we solve this? Yes, because M is not invertible. This matrix is not invertible. Because it's not a square matrix, it's a rectangular matrix. So we cannot invert M. And that's why we did the whole stuff with the uh, pseudo-inverse method. And then I claimed, okay, now this is invertible. Why is it invertible? Because this product M transpose M is a square matrix. It's always a square matrix. And now you see Octave complaining about this square matrix. How can that be? What do you know about inversion of square matrices? It should not be singular. Or in other words, even though, even if it is a square matrix, it may happen that it's singular and then you can't do the inversion. And that's what we have there. That's what exactly we have here. So this may happen all the time. It depends on your data points. Yeah? It really depends on your data points. So this is very unfortunate, but it may happen all the time and you will encounter this problem when you solve our exercises. Yeah? Um, so I, I found out yesterday that with uh, k equals 7, with a polynomial of degree 7, or let's start with a polynomial of degree 4, with degree 4 it always worked. Yeah. Here you get a solution, it always worked. Huh? 
With degree 7 it sometimes worked and sometimes didn't work. Yeah, but I mean maybe now you're motivated to listen to the lecture on I guess next Wednesday when we will talk about the, the singular value decomposition. That's a very nice uh, method which can, which even works if this matrix is not invertible. Huh? It, al it actually works always, it always works. And uh, of course, I mean, we are looking forward to seeing what happens and how the results are in such a case when we then use singular value decomposition. This is a method that scientists, mathematicians invented and it's actually not quite old. I, I don't know, but it's something like 10 or 15 years old. And, and this is very new if you look at mathematics. Huh? But, I mean, you know why people invented this method. <laughs> because uh, there is a problem. Okay, yeah, but um, I would like to switch to the lecture slides now. Is that okay? Or are there any other questions? Oh, so only seven minutes left. Maybe we continue, yeah. Uh, please repeat the question. So, will you teach us the, how to define the function y, which is here is together like sine function in the, in the beginning? So, uh, so your question is uh, how should we define this y function? Yes. So, like the, the in in the exercise or in general? In general. Oh, in general, you don't define this y function the data points they are just given from, maybe you make a measurement, you make some mechanical measurement with a machine or with a car, whatever, you measure, um, you make a crash test and you measure the, the amount of damage of your car depending on the speed and then you get data points. And now you want to approximate a function to these data points. So the data points they are just given. And here, uh, maybe you ask a question, why do we define our, our uh, data points like that? And the reason is because I want to compare the results to the original underlying function. Look, I mean, when I, when I do uh, this approximation, I do have my original sine function. Then I add some random noise to the sine function and, and now I use the data points to approximate the solution. And now I can compare the resulting solution to the original sine function and see how good it approximates the underlying function. But if I do not have this underlying function, if I just produce data points, then the only thing I can do is compare my function to the data points. Okay? I mean, that's the way to test such approximation algorithms. I mean, I can also give you an exercise with just data points, where you just have data points and, uh, yeah. Oh, we already had such an exercise. I gave you the LexMate data points uh, for the PCA exercise. You can use the LexMate data points and then approximate radial basis functions to them and look how good your approximation is. Yeah, might be, might, might be worth a trial. Yeah. But then, I mean, you can then just test it. Yeah. Okay, did you understand me? Okay. Yeah, other questions? How do we explain multidimensions? Okay, yeah. Let's talk about multidimensions. I mean, I didn't program this yesterday evening, the multidimensions, but I will do it as you do it. Yeah? Um, and now look. Yeah. Here we have the formula. Uh, oh, no. 
Um, yeah. So our basis functions, f1 through fk, we have k basis functions. Each one of these basis functions uh, produces a scalar value and that's fixed all the time. All these basis functions have to be scalar functions, but such a function f1 maps from maps some input vector x onto a scalar output value y. And this input vector x may be a vector of arbitrary length. Of arbitrary length. Um, for example, um, x1 and x2 when you, you may use as basis functions, and that's actually what we do in the radial basis function uh, section, we use multidimensional Gaussians. And such multidimensional Gaussians, of course, get a vector as input and produce um, one output value. So this function f1 of x vector may be constant times exponential to the power minus one half um, x vector minus mu vector um, divided by no sigma inverse let's see no that's uh, um, no kein Lappen Um, covariance matrix inverted times x vector minus mu vector. It's something like that. <coughs> oh no, it is. Look, it's it is x vector minus mu vector times sigma inverse times transpose x vector minus mu vector. That's about the, the formula for a multidimensional normal distribution, okay? And that's the formula which produces such a function, okay? And uh, I mean the nice thing is that you don't have, actually, you don't have to worry about this because once you apply your basis functions the result is a scalar again. And you will then produce this matrix M. Like, yeah, here, here we have the formula. Mij, this matrix, is Fj, the chth basis function, which, me, which may be like, look, in the chth basis function you then have a different uh, mean vector, you apply it to data point xi, and now this data point xi is a vector. Huh? So you apply it to a vector, but the result is a scalar, and from this uh, step on, you will get this matrix and you can continue. There is no difference in applying the pseudo-inverse or Bayesian regression, whatever. Huh? That's the point, and, and that's a very important point. So all these methods, which I showed in a one-dimensional examples because it's easy to show, you can apply them to multidimensional data. Yeah? So we can actually do multidimensional, high-dimensional regression with no problem at all. The only thing is here you have to define a function that, that maps a vector onto a scalar. Thank you for this question, it was very important. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, time is over now. We will, um, so now it's your turn to work. Huh? So sit at the computer and do these experiments. 
Um, and then the question is, I would suggest on next Monday to have an exercises session over in the Linux lab. Is that okay? Okay, thank you.